Welcome to the city. I'm Anthony Wilson, the Public Information Officer for the City of San Angelo. And joining us for our first segment today is our new city attorney, Teresa James. Teresa, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Now, you joined the city in July. Talk a little bit about your prior municipal uh, and legal experience. Um, prior to coming to the city, I worked at the city of Abilene for nine and a half years. I started there as an assistant city attorney and worked my way up to the deputy city attorney. So um, when the city attorney was out of the office, I would sit for him at council and kind of do all the responsibilities there. Prior to that, I worked for the state. Um, as a hearings examiner for the Texas Workforce Commission. And even before that, I was um, in a private firm doing civil litigation. What interested you about the job here in San Angelo? <laughs> well, I think it was the opportunity, one, to move up into the city attorney position. Abilene and San Angelo are so similar in the way that they're made up. They both have universities. They both have military bases. Um, the people are very similar. The culture is very similar. I personally think San Angelo is a little bit prettier. <laughs> I really enjoy the river. Um, so it was just an opportunity for me to move up in my career in a place that I felt really comfortable. So talk a little bit about what the role of the city attorney is and of the city attorney's office. Um, I think the city attorney's role can be very different based on what the expectations are. My view of my role is to be the legal advisor for the city as an entity. So I don't necessarily represent the people, I represent the entity. So in that way, we're very much like corporate counsel. However, we also have um, a municipal court, so we also act as the prosecutor for municipal court. But basically, our office um, handles contracts, we write ordinances, we answer everyday legal questions, we prosecute those cases, we file lawsuits occasionally against people, we defend the city against lawsuits. It's a very varied area of work. So I guess in that sort of way, municipal law is just uh, a lot less specific than, uh, than, than most lawyers practice a certain type of law. Absolutely, and that's the thing that I actually like about it, is that every single day you can come to work and do something completely different from the day before. Um, private attorneys, they often are very transactional or they perform their jobs in the very same area of law. They're criminal attorneys or they're family attorneys. We do criminal law, we do utility law, we do environmental law, we, you know, we do employment law. There's just a whole range of things that we do which keeps it very fast-paced and interesting. Now you've had about four or five <coughs> months now to get acclimated uh, to your new job. What goals do you have for your office and for your staff? You know, initially when I came, my staff was very short-staffed. It was just myself and Dan Solari. Um, and so our first goal was to bring more attorneys on board. We now have a prosecutor and starting in January we'll have a fourth attorney in our office which will really help us be a little bit more efficient. I just wanted to at first become very familiar with the city of San Angelo. The law is the same, the culture is pretty similar to what I was used to in Abilene, but you know there are differences and I wanted to understand those differences before I started making a lot of changes. But I think you know now going forward um, one of the goals for my office is just to become more efficient to um, not being only responsive but proactive. I think my, part of my role as a city attorney is not only to, or to pull the city out of trouble when they get in trouble, but to prevent them from getting there in the first place. So coming in more on the front end of projects instead of just when we're asked for help is one of my goals. What are the most challenging sorts of issues that the uh, city attorney's office has to deal with? You know, I think, um, on a personal level, the more challenging for me are the employment-related issues when there's a, a grievance against an employee. You know, these are my coworkers, these are my friends, and so it's always hard in that circumstance to handle those things. The other thing that's challenging is our calendar is very driven by city council meetings. And so every item on the agenda, and sometimes there might be 50 items on the agenda when you count the consent and all the subparts, have been through my office. Every contract has been through my office. And just keeping on top of all those things, staying knowledgeable, making sure it's all done correctly, it's just very fast paced and that is probably the most challenging. As we're filming this, you've either recently completed, you're engaged in, or you're approaching a number of ordinance changes that have sparked a lot of community discussion, beginning with the, maybe perhaps the uh, spay and neuter ordinance. Right. Was there anything in particular that, that you had to keep in mind while drafting that ordinance? You know, um, I've worked on ordinances, animal ordinances in Abilene before, multiple times, and they're always very emotionally driven ordinances. People, I love my animals, people love their animals. And so being very cognizant of that fact, that these are members of people's families that we are coming in and regulating is an important part of that. Um, we also want to make sure that whatever we're doing doesn't over-regulate. 
We don't, we live in a part of the country that regulation and freedom, personal freedoms are very important to people and it's very important to me. So figuring out what we want to do and making sure we get there in the easiest possible way with the least amount of regulation is also important. Had you worked in communities with an ordinance, a spade neuter ordinance before, and if so, how well did that work? You know, Abilene tried a couple of different times to pass a spade neuter provision and was never able to get it accomplished. And um, I've done lots of research on communities, and in a lot of communities it works really well. In some communities it doesn't seem to have the effect that they think it will, and so they rescind those provisions. I've never worked in a city that had one because Abilene, as I said, never actually passed it, but through my research, I know there are places where it works really well. The city council is also considering an ordinance to increase water rates. Is there anything specific that you had to focus on when drafting the language for that particular ordinance? You know, in drafting the language, all that we want to do is make sure that the new rates fit into our current ordinance structure really well, that they're easy to understand, that when people want to know what they're being charged, it's easy for them to find that. The bigger issue with the water rates is that, and all rates and fees that the city has, is we don't want them to be excessive and they can't be arbitrary. So what really our office was concerned about is making sure the process that we took to get to those rates was the proper process. And we did a rate study and it worked well and they came to a very reasonable you know, rate structure based on that study. There's so many different rates for so many different classes based upon the usage of each of those, uh, those customers. Does that pose a particular problem when you're dealing with that much detail and minutia in, in crafting an ordinance? It absolutely does. And um, if you compare the ordinance that's on the books today and the ordinance that's going to be passed, we have reorganized some of that so the water rates and sewer rates are in the same section and not in separate sections. And we always anticipate there's going to be something that slips through the cracks and so we might have to come back and tweak those rates occasionally. So yes, it's a, it's a kind of a complicated thing with a lot of moving parts. And I know the Water Utilities Department is also looking at conservation uh, measures. Have you started to, to look at how that ordinance might be changed as we move into sort of this new era with new rates and, and water supplies and so forth? You know, um, actually I had a conversation with Bill Riley just the other day about looking at the conservation part of our ordinance and the drought provisions are in that and the fee structure for the drought provisions are in that so I anticipate there will be some changes to that as well. Does it help having worked in another, municip another municipality and bringing some of those ideas uh, to San Angelo and saying well you know here's what I've uh, worked with before and this seemed to work and this didn't seem to work? I think that absolutely does help and the fact that the two communities are so similar and they're dealing with certain water issues together as well as you know similar water issues um, that is helpful and I do know things that did not work well in Abilene and I know things that did work well but the hurdles we had to get over to get there so I think it can make um, the decision making process here a little more efficient occasionally but St. Angelo is a unique community and we do things here the way that we want to do them so that adds a little bit of the interest to my job taking ideas that I know work and trying to give them that little St. Angelo spin. And have you encountered issues here that uh, maybe were a surprise to you that you that you really hadn't encountered in Abilene? I know it's still early in your uh, right. in your tenure here. You know I don't think there was anything that was unexpected I think the focus of the community is a little bit different um, I think people here tend to be more collaborative. They seem to be a little bit more progressive in believing that um, things such as the river, the, you know, the amenities at the river and those kind of things that benefit the whole community are important here. And that's been the like surprising difference to me that I've actually appreciated. One of the other ordinances that you're writing would ban texting while driving. Uh, you mentioned that you studied other communities and their spay neuter ordinances. What have you found uh, that has seemed to have worked in other communities in regards to banning texting while driving? You know, there's two different schools of thought, it seems, when you look at the other communities. There's those who just want to ban the texting, and there are those who want to ban you know, the use of mobile devices in their vehicles. So I think what city council is going to have to do here is decide which of those two philosophies we have. Um, the direction that I was given was to write a draft and ordinance that only talked about the texting provision. And even when you look at other city ordinances regarding just banning texting while driving, some of them ban it whenever you're on the traveled portion of the road and some only ban it while you're moving. So, you know, it's just going to be presenting to council what they directed me to and giving them enough information to let them know what else is out there. So anytime an ordinance passes it goes through a first reading which is sort of a preliminary approval before right. it goes to a second reading and final approval 
With something like that, might you expect that the ordinance might change between that first and second reading? I would expect that it would. And I think that, you know, one thing I appreciate here is we have the public hearing portion on the first reading of the ordinance. Um, my prior experience, we would always have the public hearing on the second. So when you have the public hearing portion on the first reading of the ordinance, council is able to hear directly from their constituents what they like and what they don't like. And I think that that enables us to kind of tailor the ordinances a little better to what the community wants. And I, I believe this will be one of those ordinances where that occurs. How mindful do you have to be with this particular ordinance about its enforceability? You know, enforceability is something that we deal with with all of our ordinances. And when I say enforceability, I mean really three different things. The first thing we're concerned about is constitutionality. You know, anything that a city government does can affect the, the rights of citizens. And so we have to make sure that we're not overstepping our bounds as far as what constitutional rights people have. The second thing that I want to, that we worry about is we need to draft an ordinance that is sufficient so that if there's a violation, we can prosecute it in municipal court. We want to make sure that there are clear violations and there's a clear penalty structure. And then the third part of the accountability or the um, enforceability is, is PD going to be able to actually take the ordinance and do something with it? And I know the texting ordinance that has been raised and, you know, I think there's an understanding in the legal community and the police community that the texting ordinances are, are relatively difficult for them to enforce. I mean, when you're driving down the road in your car, we're really not paying a lot of attention to what's going on in the cars around us unless they're driving erratically. So there are some issues with that, but I also believe that our code of ordinances is more than just a penal code. It's essentially a handbook on how we believe people should act while they're in our city. And um, I know the chief touched on this whenever he was presenting it at council initially, that most people are just going to follow it because it's what we as a city have said, this is what our standard is. Um, so even though there's gonna be some difficulties in enforcing it, it's not unenforceable, and I think setting that standard is very important. We hear this a lot in government that uh, the government doesn't have the right to tell people to, and then you can fill in the blank from there. Right. Whenever you hear that, how do you respond to that as the, as the city's legal counsel? Well, I think that from, I agree with that statement, that the government should be limited in their abilities to tell people how to conduct themselves on a very personal level. However, we also live in a community, and so there have to be community standards that are set, and the only way that we can do that is through setting them with things such as ordinances. You mentioned that you attend all the city council meetings. During those gatherings, what is the city attorney's role? Um, <laughs> you know, I actually enjoy the council meetings. It's kind of like the fruition of all the work that we've been doing for the past months coming to play. My role there is multifaceted. The first thing that I'm there for is, as I said, my office reviews and I review every item that's on the council agenda. We want to make sure it's legally enforceable. We want to know we understand the material well enough that if there's a question from a member of the public or from staff or from council that somebody's able to answer that. My personal philosophy is, is that if that I should be preparing the directors or whoever's presenting well enough that there should not be a question for me that they don't know how to answer. However, if there is, my responsibility is kind of to give that legal direction. Um, the second thing that I do while I'm there is I kind of watch out for upcoming issues. You know, you can hear through the public comment or through the comments of council um, which direction things are going to go. And you'll sometimes see me during council meetings give up and hand my business card to somebody who has spoken on an issue or they, there's going to be an issue coming before them. And that's because we do want as much input as possible. And then the third reason that I'm there is those meetings are governed by the Open Meetings Act. And um, participating in an illegal meeting is a criminal violation for our council members. So although St. Angelo, you know, has a certain way that they like to handle their meetings, it's important that we don't let it be handled in such a way that it violates that law. So I'm also there kind of to keep them on a path <laughs> to make sure that those rules aren't violated. We've been talking with Teresa James. She is the city attorney for the city of San Angelo. And then we'll be back in just a moment with our city clerk, Brian Kendrick. Should the city of San Angelo adopt a new logo? What should be San Angelo's brand? You, the public, will decide. The city is conducting an online survey on its website at cosatx.us slash logo survey. There, citizens will find a slate of 14 possible logos, including the current logo, which has been in use since 2003. Citizens can vote up to once daily through January 2nd. In less than a week, the survey has garnered almost 1,000 responses. In proposing the possibility of a new logo, Public Information Officer Anthony Wilson cited three potential benefits. One, it could yield a more eye-catching brand that reflects the modern, forward-thinking community San Angelo is. 
that impression, could assist in economic development efforts. Two, it provides an opportunity for corporate consistency with all city departments using the chosen logo. Three, the logo chosen could also serve as the city's seal, again, providing consistency. You know, this is also a very fun way to engage our citizens. It's an opportunity to let them decide uh, what happens uh, to some extent with their city government and how the city of San Angelo is going to be reflected to the world because the logo is one of the ways that we create an impression for people not only here in our local community but abroad. Wilson stressed no public dollars have been or will be spent on the effort. The designs were contributed by citizens and by graphic artists at McLaughlin Advertising at no cost to the city. If a new logo is adopted, it would be phased in as assets such as vehicles, uniforms, and letterhead are retired or exhausted. The winning logo will be announced at a city council meeting in early 2016. For SATV, I'm Brian Groves. Welcome back. Joining us now is our city clerk, Brian Kendrick. Brian, thanks for being with us. I'm glad to be here. Now, you were promoted to city clerk uh, in February. Talk a little bit about what the responsibilities of the city clerk and of your office are. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, our, our office is charged with, you know, several responsibilities and certainly not a comprehensive list, but really uh, three major responsibilities, first being the uh, the keeping the you know maintaining the records of the legal actions of the city council uh, and that includes of course the agendas and the minutes from those meetings and and just maintaining that that process that's the that's the number one and then number two is kind of like that we direct the management of all the city records um, throughout all the departments in accordance with state guidelines and then our uh, third major responsibilities regarding city elections. I, of course, serve as the chief elections officer, and um, by way of that, we ensure that the you know where the legal process is is you know the legal compliance is met for that process, and it also ensures the tag integrity of the elections process for the city of San Angelo. Well, with that first responsibility, maintaining the city council's records and particularly their their agendas and their minutes, you recently implemented a very slick and a very user friendly. Uh, agenda management system for city council meetings. Talk a little bit about what that system does and how you think it's going to benefit citizens' access to city council uh, actions. Right. Well, we're we're really excited about that because uh, it's called Sweet One, and and it has really moved us kind of out of the dark ages of agenda management. Uh, at least that's what I like to say. It, it moves us from from a really manual process to a much more automated and uh, you know process where all the approvers at the various levels can can view it from wherever they are. If they have an iPad or you know if they're at home whatever at any time if they're connected to the internet they can they can get on there and review items and approve them so it, it makes the process much more streamlined where everybody can kind of view it at their own time and uh, allows for us to to post the agenda a little bit more efficiently so so the state guidelines uh, for posting an agenda are really 72 hours uh, ahead of time and as you know with a city our size um, the issues that we have are pretty complex and there's a lot of issues and so 72 hours is not a lot of time to, to digest all that information. And so uh, our goal has always been to post, you know, ahead of that time frame. And, uh, you know, we had been probably about 96 hours under the manual process, which is good, uh, can, you know, com when compared to other cities. But, you know, our goal is to be as transparent for this process and to do that as efficiently as, as possible. So um, we, you know, we've implemented this process and it allows us, we, we started, we went live November 3rd with the new software and it allowed us to post the agenda uh, six days ahead of time, which the very first time, which I think was a record for the city of San Angelo even then. So, uh, and that was the November 3rd meeting. And it just, it allows, you know, the media, the public, and the city council all access to that same background information at the same time the agenda is posted as well, uh, which is, which is, gives us a much better opportunity than just having weekend hours when you have other responsibilities, your family and church and whatever else. Uh, that might come up. So it's really hard to kind of review all that information over a weekend, but having, you know, a full week or at least six days is a whole much, a whole better process uh, 
a whole lot better. So um, with the December meeting, we actually met that goal of seven days. The first meeting in December, we were posted seven days early and that uh, information was available to everyone seven days ahead of time. That includes all the background information, everything they would want to know about that item so that they can, you know, just really be knowledgeable about every topic that's on the agenda. So. And so direct our viewers to where on the website they go in order to access those agendas and that background information. Right. It's under, um, if you, uh, at the top of the website, I'm kind of trying to re think about it in my head, uh, there's city government and then if you hover over that you uh, click on city council and then under city council there's agenda, agendas, minutes and, and whatever and so you, you click on that and then you can, you know, see them by date and the the upcoming agendas are all on the top part and then the previous agendas are right below that. So it, it's been a really, really good process. We've got a lot of, a lot of neat feedback from the process. So. Of course, you're integrally involved in the construction of a city council agenda. Talk about the process of how it's determined what's going to be on an agenda and where it will be on the agenda. Okay, yeah. Um, the agenda is really driven by um, kind of several different moving parts. The uh, city uh, you know, all the citizens have certain concerns that, that you know, they might be interested in. And then the uh, city council members and the mayor might have items that they're, you know, interested in. And then, of course, city staff, city management have, you know, concerns as well. And oftentimes, those, all those concerns kind of, they line up, uh, you know, when it's regarding streets or water or whatever that's, you know, central to us. Uh, but, you know, there are oftentimes a city council member or the mayor will say, you know, I've heard from constituents about this or that, and they'll ask that an item be placed on the agenda for a discussion. Uh, so that's one of the ways it comes up. And then, you know, just through the course of business for the city, the city staff and city management, you know, regarding any of the assets for the city or any of the responsibilities of the city that need any kind of city council approval, they'll be placed on the agenda as well. Um, as far as, you know, where they line up on the agenda, our agenda is made up of several different areas and, uh, of course, you know, open session, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's really made, the major part is the three different areas of the consent agenda, the uh, executive session, and the regular agenda. Now, the consent agenda is going to be items that are really day-to-day, -day, um, sort of like the uh, the minutes from the previous agenda that need to be, uh, you know, approved officially by city council action, but don't really need a lot of discussion. Uh, so those typical kind of day by day, you know, operational type deals. And then the uh, executive session is more for confidential matters so that, you know, are related to either, you know, personnel matters or uh, could be consultation with an attorney regarding something, something that needs to be confidential. So those, those would fall in the executive session, but the bulk of the things that the, you know, the public's going to be interested in or will be placed on regular session, on the regular agenda. So, and those items we try to anticipate, you know, who's going to be at the city council, what interest level there is in a certain item, and we try to, you know, uh, stagger those items appropriately uh, for those things. And of course, if we, you know, we don't guess right and there's more, you know, more people there involved and interested in, in a certain item that might be lower on the agenda, of course, the mayor and city council have the ability to move that up a little bit higher on the agenda. So. You also serve as the point of contact for all requests for public information from the city. What's the process that a citizen goes through in order to procure a, uh, a particular public record or piece of public information? Right. Now, some of, some of our records are available on the website, and, and the website is a great tool for, for any citizen to, to use, you know, for all the public, any interested party to use, because a lot of, a lot of the information is right there on the, on the city website and doesn't even require a public information request, uh, such as the minutes and, and the agendas and stuff like that. However, if there's an item that they want that's not on the agenda, that's not on the website, um, the, the website has a form uh, under, uh, under our, our page uh, that they can download and you know, fill out and, and submit either electronically or in person. And we have that, that, uh, that form also available in person to anybody that comes by uh, to fill out. And so they, they can just fill out that form and typically it takes approximately 10 business days to respond to, to most requests. Uh, some are sooner, but some are right up against that. And then the, uh, uh, 
uh, any cost related. Most of them don't incur any cost because most of them are very basic, but just depending on the nature of the thing, it could, could incur some costs as well. You mentioned that you serve as the uh, city's chief election office. Talk a little bit about what will be on the next city ballot in May. Right, in, in May 2016, uh, we have the police chief, is, is going to be on the ballot and then the uh, city council members for single member districts one, three, and five will also be on there and so it's, it's going to be a really important election uh, and we're excited to get started. And when will the filing period for those races begin and end? Okay, the filing period begins January 20th and we actually have packets available on our website and uh, in, in our office for anybody that's interested in, in running for one of those positions. Um, and it gives them all the background information, but the, the, the first day to file is January 20th and February 19th will be the last day for filing. And recently voters approved a change to the city charter in which the t lengths of the terms of city council members was extended from two years to four years. How is that going to impact this election cycle over the next couple of city elections. Okay, so for this first election, because you know we're transitioning from the two-year terms to the four-year terms, this first election will be three-year terms for the city council members. For districts one, three, for and five. One, three, and five. And then the following and all uh, subsequent elections will be four-year periods, and that'll get them on the appropriate, uh, you know, where you're off a year and then you have an election. Uh, so, of course, that's gonna benefit and, you know, a, a significant savings of monetarily to the city, which is um, $30,000 approximately per election that we don't hold. But uh, more than, I think more than the benefit financially or, or you know, expense related to expenses is uh, the knowledge that'll be on the city council. The uh, opportunity to, uh, you know, not go right back into a campaign mode after you just got elected. Uh, so they're able to kind of sit in there in the office and learn. And there's, there's really no way to prepare for city council other than to, you know, it's on the job training. There's not like some sort of, you know, uh, some sort of way to really be completely up to speed when you come in. So, um, so it's really, it's a good process to have a four year term. That way there, there's, there's some continuity in the, in the, uh, you know, officers of the city or the, the members of the city council. You assisted the charter review committee in coming up with the, uh, the recommendations that the voters recently considered. And under the charter, the charter can't be changed any sooner than, than every two years after it has last been amended. Has there been any discussion about how often that process uh, should occur, both reviewing and potentially amending the charter? Right, well, it, it's, it's driven by needs. Uh, like you said, it can be done every two years. And, uh, and I was involved in this process and it, it was a really interesting thing to be part of. And so the, the charter review committee that we just recently had, um, they, they are, I've asked them to compose a letter to the next charter review committee of any items that they would have tackled had they wanted a longer ballot or, or whatever. So they're gonna compose that letter to the next one. And I would probably anticipate another review in two years. Um, there are a few items that they would have wanted to, you know, tackle if they had, you know, wanted more, more items on the ballot. But the problem there becomes a balance of, you know, information related to uh, uh, how many items are on the agenda, how, how the public can best digest that many items. So, Just a few seconds left. You really seem to enjoy being city clerk. What do you like about the job? Well, I think for me, it's a sense of history. You know, through the course of a, a month of, uh, the course of, of a month of just regular business from all the various uh, departments, we'll have people requesting, you know, minutes for going back all the way through the history of the city. And it's not just that city history. For me, it's personal history as well. I'm a third generation public servant. Uh, my, my grandfather, he built the roads up around Lubbock. Uh, my uh, father was a water superintendent. My mother was a city clerk. Um, my uh, oldest brother works in the water department. My uh, middle brother, he uh, was a retired police officer. And then I, you know, of course, serve as city clerk. So uh, it's, it's just neat to be a public servant in the history of a long line of public servants. So. We've been talking with Brian Kendrick. He is the city clerk for the city of San Angelo. And we hope you'll join us for the next episode of The City.